uh, I thank my institution, Shifa International Hospital, the GME department for organizing and making this possible. Uh, there is a little bit of a disclaimer from my part. I was actually told uh, that I was the one to start and I would go first and take 30 minutes and then Professor Tipozis will follow through. So I made this presentation with mind of maybe he's going to follow after this one and probably uh, correct my mistakes that I make, but <laughs> but that's, that's now reversed. So what I'm going to talk uh, is um, about uh, briefly about the management of Parkinson's disease in Pakistan. And I can uh, briefly touch upon the very good question that was asked uh, about what options do we have um, uh, for the middle class or not, not, not so much affording patients in, Park, in Parkinson's in Pakistan. And then um, in the end, I can just uh, briefly provide some evidence for deep brain stimulation and other advanced treatment options. So uh, a, a brief introduction about myself. Uh, I graduated from Ralbini Medical College. Then I uh, did my neurology training from Shifa International Hospital, which where I'm working right now. And then I did a fellowship in movement disorders at University of Nebraska Medical Center. And then I came back uh, in 2020 summer. So it's been about six months and then rejoined my parents institution, Shifa. I would really like to thank Dr. Danish Bhatti, who has been my mentor for the past many years and has uh, uh, deeply uh, has a has a, has had a profound effect on me uh, in my training and career. So what I'm gonna uh, so my talk will be about uh, three things: management of Parkinson disease in Pakistan, and then DBS for Parkinson disease, and a little bit of evidence regarding uh, DBS for other women disorders. So I start with the management part. Uh, obviously, management of Parkinson disease is complex, and uh, we just cannot um, uh, go into a lot of details here. Uh, I would, what I will do is like talk about some principles and also some of the misconceptions and uh, other uh, queries that are frequently asked by people. So, I'll, I, so it will not be a comprehensive lecture on uh, management, but it will be more focused on um, the concepts. So epidemiologically, we know that Parkinson's disease is a second most common neurologic neurodegenerative disorder after Alzheimer's, um, and PD incidence does increase as we age, uh, so it's likely to be more prevalent than it is now. In Pakistan, we do not have data, uh, population data. This is just unpublished data that I pulled up the day before yesterday from our hospital registry. Uh, that in the past four years or so, there were 454 patients with PD seen in the hospital. So it's just hospital-based data. It's not population-based. And uh, 100 with atypical Parkinsonism. These are probably underestimates of what uh, we normally see, but this is what the data, it's unpublished uh, right now as of now. So management principles. The first thing I say this very clearly, but regrettably, is that we do not have a disease-modifying therapy available for Parkinson's disease as of January 2021. Uh, so, so since we do not have it, uh, we don't treat all patients with PD with the same thing or, or the hypothetical drug or in future, I, I hope that we do have it. So that's that actually shifts the thinking that uh, we should only treat the symptoms when they are disabling. So just when uh, somebody, if you see a tremor in some, some patient and you're diagnosed with Parkinson's, it's not necessary for you to start treatment options. It's more important at that point of uh, to explain what the disease is to the patient, what they will expect to rule out uh, uh, other causes, uh, to look for secondary things and treatable options rather than jumping onto treatment uh, right away. So. Uh, treat the symptoms when they are disabling. Uh, and uh, I cannot uh, overstate this. And there are all kinds of patients with severe tremor that are okay with it. So you don't need to treat it. And there are patients with minimal tremor and they want uh, treatment. So uh, we should definitely talk um, and have a conversation with what the patients and their family wants. And I would take this opportunity to uh, stress on the role of exercise. Uh, there is animal data available that mice who exercise 
more MPTP mice, they, their rate of progression is slower as compared to uh, mice who do not exercise. Uh, and we do not have population or, uh, or human studies available uh, proving that, but it's almost agreed upon that the people who exercise more are less likely to be, be wheelchair bound in the next decade or so. So uh, I'm sure all of you who have treated patients with Parkinson disease know about this. Uh, there's definitely a progression. And uh, as, the, um, as, the, as time goes by, the management of patients with Parkinson's becomes more and more uh, problematic. So in the left, you can see that in the first one to three years, uh, we give maybe two or three times a day of levodopa or other dopaminergic medication, and then they have a, they have a good response and uh, there are no problems. But then um, many patients, as much as 50% 50 50 of patients uh, by the four to six years of uh, disease, they start having what we call as end of dose akinesia, which is a type of motor fluctuation. And then uh, almost a similar number, I will give you some figures later on, develop what we call as dyskinesias or excessive movements. So, so that's when, uh, that's when the, the treatment is challenging and it's troublesome. So uh, this actually illustrates uh, motor, fluctuations, motor fluctuations a little bit more in the upper uh, panel, you can see veering off, there is a dose of levodopa and then it starts, it works, but works for only a little time and then it goes away. So that's what we call as early veering off. Then there could be delayed on uh, and when, when we give the medication and it takes a very long time uh, to, um, to start working and mostly stomach and intestinal absor absorption is to blame for that. And then there are those failures, uh, like some doses just don't work at all. Again, it's more related to, uh, to the intestinal system. And then there are random on-off uh, sorry, motor fluctuations that are very hard to treat. So this is a list that I borrowed from this evidence-based review published by Movement Disorder Society in 2018. It lists all the medications available uh, for Parkinson's disease. Uh, it, they list them as monotherapy, um, uh, therapy for motor fluctuations and therapy for dyskinesias. But uh, more importantly, I so this is what the, 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 the drugs that are available in Pakistan right now are highlighted and the other options, I just grade them out. So what we have available as of mid-January 2021 is levodopa, cinemet, thank God for that. What would we have done without it? But levodopa is available, ropinirol, uh, selegiline, amantadine, ropinirol again, and checkapone, uh, zonisamide. Uh, and then now uh, we are talking about developing a DBS uh, uh, service. So, uh, and there are other options too, anticholinergics and amantadine that are used all the time. We, I'm sure you know that. Um, but there are uh, things to consider because anticholinergics, they might help tremor and or rigidity, but they do not help with bradykinesia. They do have many side effects and mostly they're reserved for younger patients. Uh, pa patients have like elderly have a lot of urinary constipation um, and other confusion and other problems with that. Amantadine, um, it has a very complex mechanism of action. It works on many receptors. Um, it is the most often used treatment for dyskinesia, although amantadine IR or the immediate release amantadine available in Pakistan has not been shown to reduce dyskinesia. It's only the extended release amantadine or Gokobri brand name, uh, which has been shown to reduce dyskinesia, but it's, it's still the most commonly used drug. Uh, and then uh, we, we, there's just a word of caution that we should be careful in patients with um, renal disease. So common misconceptions of patients regarding levodopa are, and they are all misconceptions, all of the statements are wrong actually. So if I take levodopa now, I will develop tolerance to it. I'm afraid to start levodopa because I will use up the good time. I should only take medication when I find it impossible to carry out my life. So just to think of the idea of suffering uh, and not 
taking medication. And then levodopa will cause faster progression of my Parkinson's disease. And then if I start levodopa, I will be unable to get off of it. And the last one is probably the most important. That's why I put it in bold face is that if I start levodopa early, I will develop more and early dyskinesia. And this, I write this as a, as a misconception. This is what I think we should understand because I've heard and I've uh, seen neurologists all over the country and, uh, and abroad thinking about not using levodopa early on, uh, fearing that it will cause early and more uh, dyskinesia, but I, uh, this is not true. And uh, this, is, this is why I write it as a misconception. So uh, I, don't have, I don't think we have time to go through a lot of literature review regarding levodopa, but just a couple of studies. Uh, L-DOPA study was the first and only, it's actually one of the only two controlled trials of levodopa in Parkinson's disease. Uh, and that was done in 2004. And that the, the important point was that it did show uh, a dose dependent improvement in clinical Parkinson's score, but the patients who were treated with a higher dose still did not uh, uh, match up the placebo group after a two weeks wash up period. And that led to a, a more than a one and a half decade of discussion uh, regarding is levodopa neuroprotective or not. And I think that mystery was solved by this very well done trial in January of 2019 that uh, they did a longer washout period. So what they did was they divided 445 patients into two groups. Uh, the first one was treated with levodopa for eight, 40 weeks and the other one was deprived of treatment and then at four, uh, at the end of 40 weeks like the mid part of the study both groups were treated the same and the important thing i uh, is that you can see in the upper graph is that the delayed start group and the early start group both took just a few weeks to catch up and since then they were doing behaving exactly the same so the gist of this uh, is that even if they, if you start levodopa early or you deprive them of levodopa, they still have a similar rate of progression uh, in part of Parkinson's. And it's just that uh, the patients who were deprived of levodopa for the 40 weeks, they just had a miserable, miserable 40 weeks. So, and uh, I think it's a very good study. Uh, we should definitely read the full thing. And it's important to highlight that there was no differences in the two groups in disease progression, no differences in the rate of dyskinesia, and there were no differences in levodopa-related dyskinesia. So exercise, I did talk about it earlier. It's, uh, the, it's the more you do it, the better it, it is. And this is the data regarding motor, motor fluctuation and dyskinesia I was talking about, that this is the study of 143 PD patients I'm sorry, I forgot how long the disease duration was when they looked at it, but it shows that 66% of them had fluctuations and 57% of them had levodopa induced dyskinesia. So more than half is a safe number to say that they have this, these complications. So uh, this is, uh, so I'm sorry, it's a busy slide, but um, I, I've advocated the use of levodopa a lot uh, up until now. Uh, but uh, when it's not enough or when it's causing side effects or when it's causing troublesome dyskinesia motor, motor fluctuations, what, what, what then? So first of all, we can try other formulations of levodopa. There are uh, like five or six other formulations that I have listed, but only the first one, the top one is available in Pakistan as of now. So Cinemet CR and Cinemet Extra uh, are the ones that are available. But remember, these are controlled release formulations. They do they take a long time to absorb, and then they do not get absorbed fully. So, what I want to say is that, like for a tablet of Cinemet CR fifty two hundred, uh, it has levodopa two hundred, but it the whole two hundred will not be absorbed. So it will probably end up yielding only one hundred and thirty milligrams, or maybe one hundred and twenty milligrams of levodopa. So it'll probably uh, Will, so you'll have to adjust the dose accordingly because uh, it's not the full 200 that is going to be absorbed. So there are other formulations available, but uh, not, uh, I don't think we should talk more about them since they are not available here. And then we do have options regarding dopamine agonists, ropinirole, MOB inhibitors, selegiline, COMT inhibitors, and decapone. Just a few words about them. So dopamine agonists, I think these are the second most uh, uh, efficacious drugs after levodopa, 
they uh, do uh, cause dyskinesia. So if you use them, uh, use a higher dose, uh, they will end up uh, uh, with dyskinesia. Uh, we should watch out for excessive daytime sleepiness, uh, sleep attacks, and the uh, very troublesome uh, impulse control disorders. Um, and then MEOB inhibitors, selegiline, uh, it is uh, available in Pakistan and it does improve UPDRS by like 12 points. It does add off time, uh, 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 does add to the on time by like one or one, 1 1.5 hours. So it is effective, uh, but, and it also breaks down and yields amphetamines. So it does have the side effect of raising blood pressure, uh, but it helps with fatigue. So, so that uh, it, it, I think it's a good choice to uh, start. Um, COMT inhibitors, I'm, uh, I'm sorry, I'm not a big fan of them. Uh, they uh, don't work as well as levodopa and they, call all, they cause as much dyskinesia as levodopa. So I still have trouble of finding very good patients that could benefit from entecapone. Just what, uh, 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 what I can think is that if you give levodopa and then they, they still don't get the kick that they want, and you are not able to increase levodopa because of some other reasons, then entecapone is a good choice. It does prolong the, uh, the on time, but only by a little bit. bit. And then uh, it's probably much easier to just increase the dose of levodopa uh, rather than adding entecapone. Then there are non-dopaminergic therapies that I talked about, so anticholinergics and mandadine. So what in summary I, uh, of this management, I would say that most patients with Parkinson's, even though they have motor fluctuation and, and dyskinesia, they, we, do, we are able to manage clinically uh, by these adjustments. There are times when uh, these are not enough. So, but this is uh, a gray line, when to start advanced therapies. Uh, again, it's a choice of the patient and their families. Uh, there is no hard and fast rule that, okay, now we should definitely go to advanced therapies or not. Um, some people say that, okay, I cannot take drugs three, more than three times a day, so I should get a DBS. Others can say, oh, I just take levodopa and I'm fine and oh, it's okay if I would just take it every two hours, uh, so what? So I don't want DBS. So, so it's, it's, it is a patient preference. The FDA, the US FDA has listed in its indication as uh, motor fluctuations and dyskinesia. If they are troublesome, then that is a valid indication uh, to get DBS and do it for, the, for the insurances to approve DBS there. I just a brief mention, a couple of slides, Duopa, it's not available in Pakistan yet, but it is a very, very effective treatment option uh, it just uh, delivers levodopa through an intestinal gel, and it, uh, it increases off, increases on time by more than four hours. DBS increases on time by like five hours or 5.2, and this duopa can do by like 4.6. So it's probably close to as efficacious as DBS in 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 the right patients. So a little bit about DBS. I'm sure uh, you. Uh, after Tipu Aziz, uh, I don't know <laughs> how what I can say, but uh, just for the for those who want to know, uh, who don't know much about DBS or want to know their its principles, so it's just just as, this is just a picture of skull radiograph uh, with bilateral uh, leads implanted. Uh, I don't know which target, maybe STN or GPI. We cannot tell from this X-ray, but still, uh, this is a picture of a patient getting it. And this, uh, I and I just uh, I've been stressing a lot that DBS is not disease modifying, but still, look how much difference it can make in the quality of life of the patient. Look, this is a Parkinson's patient from my university where I was trained, at the University of Nebraska Medical Center, and this is uh, his best state with all the medication adjustment. Look at the tremor and the chemtocormia and everything, and this is the patient with DBS on. So. You can say that it doesn't change the life expectancy or whatever, but it has a tremendous effect on the quality of life of, of, the, of these patients. So uh, just a brief mention, I did recently write a review of deep brain stimulation of, uh, for Parkinson's disease in Pakistan, the current status, opportunities, and challenges. It was recently published last month, and you are invited to have a look. 
So, um, and this is just some evidence that I, Gary, uh, that I gathered uh, to say that um, DBS is effective, and I'm sure you won't doubt that. But uh, this is the uh, pioneer trial of uh, DBS, and I'm honored that I got training with the second author here, Kenneth Follett. Uh, he's the neurosurgeon that I the, train, got trained with, um, and uh, he's the one who. Um, uh, get, got DBS approved for PD. Um, and then uh, just a brief mention, like it increases on time, as I was saying, like 4.6 hours in this study. And I've read some studies regarding five hours too. Uh, then uh, we, uh, Professor Tipo Aziz uh, briefly mentioned, uh, maybe or probably did not mention about different targets for Parkinson's disease. Uh, there are more than one, so we can the big two are subthalamic nucleus and GPI, like with GPI's globus pallidus interna. So, um, and there was a big debate for many years regarding which one is better. Uh, and then, then came this trial again by Dr. Follett uh, that showed that to control the motor symptoms of Parkinson's, both are equally effective. Um, and I repeat, it's just the motor symptoms. There are other differences uh, which uh, definitely should be taken into account. But uh, as far as the motor symptoms go, they are effective uh, equally. All right, so what does DBS do? It does not slow down the progression. I just keep on repeating that to hammer this into your heads and ho hopefully also uh, hammer this into the patient's head and their relatives because Many times uh, people, can, people can come that, oh, I'm still worsening at the same time. Uh, I, I think a safe statement to give patients is that the best state you are in uh, with the medication can be prolonged to hopefully last 24 hours with DBS. So uh, I talked about loss of motor fluctuation and dyskinesia, but you can probably, it's, I think it's a very safe and realistic statement that you can give. Uh, it's, I said, hopefully less because it does not last 24 hours. There are still fluctuations there. They, they still usually take medications. Um, I've uh, yet to see a patient who came off completely off of medications after DBS, but the medication reduction does happen with ST and DBS a lot. Um, tremor is an exception because tremor improvement with DBS can usually be better than what we can get with medications. So that's an additional advantage. And we must understand, but does not get better with DBS, non-motor symptoms, fatigue, uh, so many other things that are happening in the lives of Parkinson's disease patients. Uh, if they think that they'll be, as they did not have Parkinson's, that is a wrong uh, uh, expectation. So it has to be a very clear discussion and, uh, of expectations and expected benefits. And if we must understand what can worsen with DBS, cognition, uh, if, this, if there's a start of dementia, uh, hallucinations, depression, depression more so can worsen with the STN. It has not been shown to worsen with GPI. Uh, falls, uh, again, falls in Parkinson's are multifactorial. Uh, there is lots of reasons. If the falls are because of being an off state, it can, they can actually decrease with DBS. But overall, if the falls are because of ataxia, then probably it's gonna get worsened. And there's lots of other things, speech, uh, verbal fluency, other things can worsen with DBS. So it's, it's, a, it's a tough call. Uh, uh, this is, uh, I looked at, for, uh, to prepare this talk, I looked at the latest uh, on uh, DBS and guess what? I, uh, an article by our own Deepu Aziz came up and it was published last month, I think, uh, maybe in November uh, 2020. And it's an excellent article regarding the current technology and then future directions. Uh, I, I encourage you all to go through it. Uh, I don't think we need to talk about that. Professor Tipu uh, alluded to all of that. Uh, there are different types of leads and electrodes. We can skip that. Uh, programming of DBS is a complex art. We can skip that. Uh, this is one of the new future things uh, is adaptive DBS. Again, mentioned briefly by Professor Tipu Aziz, we can skip that. And this is um, uh, probably uh, what uh, I can uh, spend some minutes on. This is the flowchart that I wrote as part of that article that I just mentioned of how, like what's the process of a Parkinson's disease patient getting a DBS. So first of all, they must have a clinical evaluation by a neurologist who is familiar with the expectations and all of that. So it, the goals, goals must be aligned. 
Then levodopa challenge test means that we just admit the patient in an off state, we see how bad they are, then we give them levodopa, we see how good they are, and then we see if that difference is meaningful. We also must get a, a neuropsychological evaluation to make sure that we are not, that they are not develop, developing dementia. Uh, and then all of this data should be gathered uh, and it, uh, by a team involving the neurosurgeon, the neurologist, the physical therapists, uh, who have done the evaluations and the neuropsychologists uh, to make a, a team to see and that this patient is good and which new which nucleus to target and then the, we have this tbs surgery after, after the surgery is done uh, then the initial programming is a longer one the first session is like four hours or so in which we make sure that the impedance is fine the everything the circuit is working and what different uh, electrodes are there doing and then there are follow up follow-up programming sessions. So in good uh, centers, uh, it takes about six months after getting DBS to usually end up on a good state uh, of with programming. So it's it's a long and tedious process even after DBS. Uh, and um, I would like to mention this to, uh, article by Mike Oaken, who is uh, running a very good DBS surgeon uh, center at University of Florida at Gainesville. Um, and he's very respected by the DBS community, I'm sure. So he say he evaluated 41 DBS failures, uh, and then uh, he divided, he looked into the different causes and uh, reasons, and he ended up saying that 30 percent of percent of them had a misdiagnosis. So so that's huge. I mean, like 10 of the 41 did not have Parkinson's disease. They might they might have drug induced or Parkinson plus or whatever. So. So that's a huge thing. That's why the role of neurologists uh, is important. And that's why the screening process, it should not be a knee jerk decision. It has to, like, we should always take different things into account. And these are the 41 patients that were implanted in US by different centers. So it's not, uh, the, they were like done in a rush, but still it, it does happen. It's, it'll probably is, is going to happen, but we should try to minimize uh, diagnostic errors. So just a couple of slides regarding other uh, movement disorders. I wrote GPI uh, in big uh, for DBS in dystonia because GPI is the main target, although STN can also be used. And there is lots of evidence that it does work for primary generalized dystonia, for tardive dystonia. There is evidence for segmental dystonia. There's evidence for dy dystonia associated with NBIAs uh, and other dystonia. So it is a very powerful treatment option uh, for dystonias uh, that are medically refractory. Then VIM uh, for essential tremor, it is again uh, a very powerful treatment option for the patients who have failed medications. So, and there's lots of evidence in it uh, for that and it is established. So in conclusion, first of all, let me say, by, uh, let me, uh, say again that most patients with PD, tremor dystonia can be managed medically. Uh, in very good centers of movement disorders, more than 80% of patients with Parkinson's don't get DBS. So it's not that it's for everyone. We have to be very selective. Number two, uh, for PD, severe motor fluctuation and troublesome dyskinesia are the most common indications um, uh, for advanced therapies. And STN and GPI DBS are effective in, in improving UPDRS scores and, and also the on time without troublesome dyskinesia uh, in PD. And for dystonia and essential tremor, DBS is a powerful treatment option in medication refractory cases. So uh, I think uh, I can stop here and I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Of course, I had a few questions for you. Uh, one of them was like, uh, considering you've just returned and you've been working with us back again uh, for six months, uh, uh, do you recommend like, uh, uh, to other people and neurologists uh, to sub-specialize and to do fellowships like you've done in movement disorders. Uh, do you think it will help you a lot? <laughs> well, I, I did not see that coming. Uh, thank you so much for that question. Uh, I, I think everything uh, is not for everybody. Uh, we should think about what we uh, want to do in our lives. I think every uh, person is important. Uh, starting from a general practitioner to a medical specialist, to a neurologist, to a subspecialized neurologist like me. Um, I think uh, whatever suits us, uh, our mind, our thinking, our attitude, uh, we should just do that. 
Uh, I'm not saying one is superior to the other. Both everybody is important in the society. Um, like for example, if you if you, since you asked me directly, I would say that like my thinking is that I want to be very good in one thing, and I can like I'm okay to forget about others. So I I mean it doesn't trouble me now that I I'm not very good uh, in. So other my course. question was very simple. Do you think it has helped you? Oh, it it definitely has. So since I was always looking at uh, uh, at uh, opportunities of specializing in one thing or the other, mm -hmm. and uh, and I'm I'm very grateful for that. Thank you. The second question is like, uh, what do you think? Like, uh, considering you've uh, seen the whole setup and everything, uh, uh, the treatment of movement disorders that's been ongoing. Uh, skipping the functional bit because I do tend to offer functional neurosurgery for epilepsy as well. That's a separate topic. But uh, what do you think the future lies for movement disorder uh, considering the current circumstances in Pakistan? Uh, you mean the surgery for movement disorders, right? Well, uh, from medication point of view, I think, no, you're still the probably the only uh, fellowship trained uh, movement disorder specialist in Pakistan. So that would be the, like, what do you think the future lies? Um, yeah. What do you recommend to other neurologists? I would just briefly also mention that Dr. Shazma Khan is also, I think uh, she's fellowship trained mm -hmm. too, and she's also working in Pakistan. So we should definitely mention her mm -hmm. name as well. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, so uh, I think a, a very important uh, hindrance that I'm having here is the availability of drugs. So like more than 20 or 30 drugs that I've got trained in while doing fellowship, mm -hmm. I cannot prescribe them here. So, so that, mm -hmm. that troubles me a lot. And then, uh, then the second thing, as Professor Tipozi has mentioned, is the cost of some of the uh, other things. So, I think it's going to get better. Uh, I'm very hopeful. I am, and uh, one, a third thing that bothers me is the lack of uh, our own data. Uh, I think we definitely need to get our own reliable data instead of just uh, getting data from uh, our neighboring countries. So. Uh, we need to have population studies. We need to have good hospital registries. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that that will definitely help us convince the stakeholders and the uh, companies and the drug companies to offer their medications here if we are able to provide some numbers. Mm -hmm. Because without that, they will just ask, like, why should we make this cheaper? I mean, what's the, what's mm -hmm. the market? So definitely, I think I'm very hopeful that things will improve. Okay. Well, that's a good thing. Uh, on this note, uh, I think uh, this was uh, the first session of our uh, uh, webinar series. Uh, and today we talked in detail about uh, uh, movement disorders. Uh, we had Professor Tipo Aziz, if you, some of us, or some of you have joined late as well, uh, who is the leading authority, uh, currently the leading authority in the world on functional neurosurgery. Uh, but I think there are more good talks coming up as well. Uh, there are people uh, from all around the world who will be joining and talking about their experiences uh, in various subspecialties of uh, neurosurgery. And uh, of course, today, like we had uh, Nabil, uh, talking about uh, neurology aspect of movement disorders. Similarly, we'll have our own uh, physician colleagues from here uh, talking about the medical aspects of the neurosurgical conditions that we treat. And uh, I recommend that uh, the more people join, the more you learn uh, from world leaders uh, in uh, neurosurgery. So many thanks all, uh, those who joined. Thank you.